Released in 1996 by Atlas on the original PlayStation and later remastered for the PlayStation Portable, Shin Megami Tensei Persona would be the first installment in a new subseries. Directed by Koji Okada, who was one of the original creators of the Megami Tensei series and written by Tadashi Satomi, despite being a spin-off, the game would be the first entry of the franchise to be released in the US. For story, the game features a young high school student with a pierced ear, alongside eight other party members, though only five can be fielded in battle at a time, as it deals with themes of Jungian psychoanalysis mixed with the series staples of gods and demons. For gameplay, players can visit locations and dungeons around an overall map of the town, as they balance exploring the town in an isometric third-person perspective, and dungeons in a first-person perspective. Battles are turn-based with menus set on a field as various effects and attacks affect different spaces of areas, and enemies can shift positioning. When battling, the moods of demons are now displayed, and expanded options to engage them are provided that can help the player direct the desired result towards being recruited, giving them an item, or running away. Monsters, called Personas, can now level up on their own, besides being used for fusions for more powerful monsters. The game would also establish some common elements in the series, such as the Shining Butterfly providing guidance, Igor in the Velvet Room, and taking place in the same universe. The original US release would be named Revelations Persona and cut content including a major branch and quest and alter many characters and aspects of the game. A later HD port would improve visuals, add new music and cinematic cutscenes, include the previously cut and altered content, and will be the version covered here. Keep in mind there is no canon in-game name for the player character, and so the name used for the official manga adaptation, Naoya, will be used. The story only gets larger from here so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. The game begins with a butterfly and a philosophical question of dreams versus reality, as in an empty classroom of St. Hermelin High School, seven skeptical students make a bet to test an urban myth to summon a spirit here. By circling the classroom, they invite it by chanting the word Persona, and are shocked to see it works as a ghostly little girl in white appears. She begs them for help, as four members of the group are suddenly knocked out, reality bends, and they find themselves before a man named Philemon, who welcomes them to the realm between consciousness and unconsciousness. One student, a boy with an earring named Naoya, impresses him by being able to remain self-aware here, and Philemon points out the multiple cells within Naoya. He shares that everyone puts on a different mask depending on where they are, who they're with, or what their role is. However, Naoya has such a strong will and firm grip on his identity that Philemon wishes to present him with a gift. He grants him Persona, the ability to manifest the many personalities within him in the forms of gods and demons, and warns him he will need his power soon. As Naoya wakes up in the nurse's office, he finds the others also had the same dream, as their teacher urges them to get checked out at the hospital where another student, Maki, has been for over a year. Naoya leaves alongside his classmates, the arrogant and pragmatic Nanjo, the rebellious and loudmouthed Masao, also called Mark, and the mature-minded former delinquent, Yukino. As they leave, they are met by the butler serving Nanjo's affluent family, and arriving, it turns out Mark secretly visits Maki on his own. Maki mentions that despite being bedridden for over a year, she recently started getting better ever since she had a particular dream about a nice fatherly man. Her mother works at the major energy company, Sebek, though Maki resents that her mother prioritizes her work over her. Maki suddenly cries out and collapses, and as she is rushed to the ICU, the ground starts to rumble violently. When it subsides, Mark rushes to check on Maki, though is shocked to see the doors now lead to nowhere. Hearing a scream, the group hurries to find a nurse exclaiming the dead are now rising, though she was saved by Nanjo's butler. As the zombies now approach the group, a powerful blue spirit comes out of Naoya, destroying it easily. It introduces itself as the Buddhist deity of protection, same in Congo, as similar spirits come from the other students. Mark produces the Nigerian god of war, Ogun. Yukino produces the Roman goddess of hearth and family, Vesta, and Nanjo produces a Buddhist deity of wisdom, Aizen Myo'o. Though they destroy the zombies, Nanjo's butler still dies while encouraging him to be strong and look forward. The group marvels at their newfound Persona ability, continuing to explore the hospital as they see others are trapped here too and the town is covered in a strange haze. Along the way, Yukino shows an eagerness to help those in need while Nanjo believes they should focus on their own survival, as another classmate who was there during the summoning arrives, Eriko, also called Ellie, who seems unfazed by the demon infestation, and is actually quite interested in the mythical and paranormal. She surprises the group with her strong fencing skills, and is surprised herself when a Persona of her own comes out, Nike, the Greek goddess of victory. Nanjo confirms the suspicion that she also had a similar dream about a butterfly like they did, and Ellie reports the town is overrun by demons with no way to escape, but the school seems safe for now. She also mentions Maki's mother has been hurt at a nearby shrine, and Mark is motivated to help her. Arriving at Elias Shrine, they find a shining butterfly there, and are soon before Philemon again, who informs them they are at a crossroads right now. Maki's mother now stirs, having been shot, and says some men under Kandori, an executive of Sebek, did it. 
She reveals Kandori was behind certain alterations made to the town, and she was in charge of developing a special device called the Deva System. While it was meant to affect reality, she didn't expect to do all this, and Kandori says he didn't care about what happened to the town. She urges them to report Kandori to the police before passing out, and not wasting any time, a concerned Mark begins to head out. He's paused by Nanja, who agrees to help him, while Yukino insists they take Maki's mother to the school where it's safe. Bringing her back, Yukino and Ellie move to secure the school as Naoya is suddenly met by Maki, but not only is she healthy and on her feet, but strangely upbeat. So much so, even her close friends like Ayase find her awfully suspicious. Nanjo returns, managing to secure them some weapons and guns, and so the group arms themselves, as it's tiring to constantly rely on their personas. Checking around, an occult-loving classmate, Tsutomu, mentions the Snow Queen fairy tale, as it used to be their school drama club's traditional play. The Snow Queen is usually performed while wearing a mask, but the mask is cursed, as every student who wore it while playing the role has died of unnatural deaths. Though, there is a rumor one girl actually survived. Naya learns it was his teacher, Miss Seiko, who was the last person to play the role eight years ago, though she lost her best friend, and since then the mask was purified under rumor of a curse. Finding the stored mask, Naya takes it with him, as he returns to see Maki and Mark leave for the police station. Miss Seiko comes in, hearing she just missed Maki, but sees the mask Naya has. She recounts the Snow Queen fairy tale and jokes that the mask was rumored to be cursed and puts it on, but suddenly, Naoya, Yukino, and Ayase are knocked out. When they wake up, the school's frozen over and the mask itself has taken over Miss Seiko, exhibiting strong ice powers. It declares itself the Snow Queen, and states it intends to sacrifice Miss Seiko and bring forth the Eternal Knight. Confident, it challenges them to try and stop it by taking the mask off of Seiko, and it freezes her and threatens to shatter both. It invites them to play a game while it prepares its rituals, wherein they are now trapped in the school and there are three towers in this castle of ice. If they can defeat the guardian of each tower before midnight, it'll free Seiko and the school. Ayase blames Naoya for this mess, demanding he fix it, as Philemon appears before them again as a shining butterfly. He tells them the demon mirror can remove the effects of the mask's curse, but it must be reconstructed from the twelve shards scattered among the three towers. He hands them the frame, telling them to reflect their teacher once it's been assembled, and they can save her. Yukino is determined to save Seiko, as Seiko once saved her from a life of delinquency, and intends to put her past and strength to good use. Ayase opts to stick with them for safety, and they retrieve Ellie to help them, as she is with Tsutomu looking at a strange door in the library. The proud Nanjo opts to come along, seeing it as their only way out, and they encounter a student named Toro claiming to have a demon of his own. He was once brutally rejected by Ayase and offers to protect her if she'll go out with him, but she again harshly declines his offer. Ayase once again stomps on Toro's feelings with unnecessary roughness, and mad, he allows his persona, the Buddhist demon of temptation, Mara, to take over his body as it bursts out to attack Ayase. In retaliation, a persona, the Islamic mythical maiden of paradise, Huri, emerges from Ayase to protect her and defeat Toro's persona without killing him. In amazement at their mutual new power, they encounter a strange blue area outside reality called the Velvet Room, as they are welcomed by a long-nosed man named Igor, alongside a songstress named Belladonna, and a blindfolded nameless pianist. He mentions only those bound by a contract may enter, and he looks forward to helping the students hone their persona power here. Later, they learn Seiko once fought with her best friend Timomi over who would play the Snow Queen, as they stand before the intimidating Thanatos Tower, named after the Greek god of death. Its guardian, the self-acclaimed school idol Yuriko, steals their personas, forcing them to detour to Tartarus, the land of the dead, as a means of reclaiming them. As they battle, even Nanjo is forced to recognize Naoya's strength and leadership, asking him that after they free the school, to help him in following Mark to the police station. Overcoming the many traps of Thanatos Tower, they feel despair in the air, as Yuriko mentions how she died here but now lives forever, alone but forever beautiful. She offers the same to the girls of the group, but not even the vain Ayase falls for it, infuriating Yuriko as she reveals her persona, the Greek god of nonviolent death, Thanatos. When the group defeats her, a sense of relief comes to Yuriko, not happy with the immortality she thought she wanted. She was living a truly happy life before, but then fear gripped her that she would lose it and things would only get worse over time as she grew older. It was then the Snow Queen's mask she wore during the play spoke to her and told her she could live forever exactly as she was, and since then has been in this tower, young and beautiful but regretting her choices. She thanks them and passes on, fueling Yukino's sense of justice as a group passes by a pair of Jack Frost dressed as students, claiming to come from Devil's Peak, a side area where many thriving demons wait to come over. Now venturing into the imposing Nemesis Tower, the Guardian has a very arrogant schoolgirl named Michiko looking down on the group and seeking to torture them for fun. As they climb this tower, they pass by Toro and Satomu, captured and put in their own individual hells, and encounters temptations even Nanjo considers awfully suspicious. The negativity and pain of those within the tower fuel her, as Michiko reveals her persona, the Greek goddess who enacts retribution on those who become arrogant, Nemesis. They defeat her, but sore at losing, Michiko insists they bullied her five against one, and she's done nothing wrong. 
She reveals she used her wealth and influence to claim the role of the Snow Queen, bribing or inciting expulsion against all who opposed her. But because no one took her side, she accepted the offer the Mask made to help her and empathize with her. She gives them the win for now, but promises spiteful revenge as the group completes more of the mirror and rescues their classmates. Facing the final Hypnos Tower next, they note the drowsiness sweeping over them as they pass several students and faculty put to sleep within it, and Philemon appears before them, telling them the tower's master is trapping everyone's souls within a dream world. Entering everyone's dreams, they wake everyone up, soon finding the master of the tower, a glasses-wearing schoolgirl named Kumi. When asked why she chooses to trap people, Kumi replies it's because people are happiest living inside their own dreams, and the real world will never be as good as the dream world. She tells him of how, when she won the role of the Snow Queen, she was told to drop Drama Club and focus on her studies by her parents and maintain her high ranking in the school, upsetting those who could not earn the part nor perform as well academically as her. In their jealousy, they bullied her at school for not pursuing drama, and at home she was scolded for not focusing on just grades by parents who reminded her how much they sacrificed for her. With everyone telling her she's wrong and nobody listening to her, she felt suffocated at no fault of her own. When the Snow Queen mask provided her a dream world to escape from her pain, she happily took it. Still, the others point out that even though all that happened, she's just running away from her problems and blaming others for it, as she also never once spoke her mind honestly to anyone and just accepted being a victim. Yukino also suspects that she's not even the real Kumi, that this is just the dream version and the real one is elsewhere. Pressing on, they indeed find the real Kumi, who wastes no time in summoning her persona, the Greek god of sleep, Hypnos, but is defeated anyway. She laments her loss, but Nanjo points out that it's good to have dreams, but they're not there to hide within and won't be yours just by waiting. She acknowledges their strength in her grudge, wishing she was stronger when she bore the mask, and Ellie reminds her that for recognizing her weaknesses, she's on the path to becoming stronger already. Thanking them, Kumi leaves, giving them the last shard they need for their demon mirror. Hurrying back to Seiko, they hold the mirror up, and in its reflection, the ice barriers melt around her and the mask is safely forced off of her face. A burned student now stands before them, angry at them for taking Seiko's side, as the mask grows larger and attacks the group. Banding together, the misfit group of students work together to defeat the curse looming over the mask, their teacher, and their school. Succeeding, Seiko recovers while asking about Tomomi, the spirit possessing the mask, as it turns out she was also someone who wore the mask and was her best friend in Drama Club. Wondering why her friend would harbor such powerful resentment, Seiko reflects that years ago, Tomomi was to play the role of the Snow Queen, but was fearful of the rumored curse, though Seiko was more glad her friend got the title role. Tomomi then later learned that the more talented Seiko actually bowed out of auditioning and allowed her to win, and gossip spread she forced the part onto Tomomi because of the curse. The day before the play, Tomomi met with Seiko, as the mask of the Snow Queen would not come off easily, instead burning off half of her face. Seiko then reflects that even though she's not strictly at fault for what happened to Tomomi, she's not unrelated, thinking that in her effort to be considerate of her best friend, she ended up hurting her. Nanjo then notices nothing has changed, despite saving Seiko and defeating the mask. A robe woman now appears before them, thanking them for freeing her from the mask and her host body, as she is actually the Night Queen and will engulf the world in void and sorrow with the Eternal Night. Figuring out this to be Tomomi's persona, the Greek goddess of the night, Nyx, they see she is now able to work independently and hurry to stop the ritual. Seiko notices they haven't known each other very long despite being classmates and already so strong working as a team. Before they leave, the spirit of Tomomi comes out, thanking them for helping her find peace and transforms the demon mirror into a powerful shield they can use. She thanks them again, but Iyase now steps forward, thanking her, admitting that this journey has showed her that she's also been unknowingly hurting others with her words and actions, and she'll be better going forward. As they climb the Night Queen's ice castle, they encounter a girl that looks like Maki but wearing a strange mask who resents the happiness of others and says she'll destroy the whole school in her despair, covering everything in black. However, Nanjo reminds them the real Maki is still outside with Mark, but they later encounter a little girl in black looking for their father, and a similar looking girl in white looking for the masked Maki. They begin to notice the ice castle resembles the old school from long ago, and soon meet the former student council president in a mask, asking about the masked Maki as well. He mentions to the side that this iced over school is a byproduct of her heart, but it won't affect his plans. Nanjo isn't fooled, recognizing the man as Kandori, as Kandori taunts them before fading away. Approaching the Night Queen on the old stage, they are paused by Masked Maki, asking them why they are trying so hard to protect the school as she hates it and also wants it to disappear, and the Masked Kandori appears to assist the Night Queen. Combining their powers to form a massive monster, both sides clash, as the Battle of Wills would end with victory favoring the ragtag group of students. Though falling, the Night Queen says that the Eternal Night will fall again as long as people seek to turn hope into despair, and the Masked Maki is more surprised she lost within her own world. The Masked Man observes that improvisations will not work, and so they must take things into their own hands, telling Nalia they'll see each other again, and they both leave for now. 
The Curse of Ice lifts quickly across the school and not wasting any time, Nanjo states he's going ahead to check on Maki and Mark, especially since the masked girl resembles Maki too much. Seiko then thanks them all on behalf of herself, the faculty, and everyone in the school. The group knows there is still work to be done around town and so move out, and afterwards, Seiko notices the shining butterfly and wishes them all well in their next endeavor. Meeting up later, Nanja now comes in, saying Mark was captured by demons in the police station. Maki chooses to join them, though asks odd questions she should already know the answer to, and insists she was actually never in the hospital herself. Nanja suspects she may have selective amnesia, but when they are attacked, she produces a persona of her own, Maso, a Chinese goddess of protection at sea, so they agree to take her with them. They find Mark's cell, alongside Hidehiko, also called Brown, a flashy and cocky classmate also in the initial group of seven, though Mark is concerned about Maki. As they fight through the demon-possessed police station, a panicked Brown surprises himself by producing his own persona, Namine, Irish goddess of the chaos of war. Seeing now they cannot go to the police about Kandori's scheme, they decide to investigate on their own, checking out the hidden entrance to Sebek Maki's mother mentioned. Passing by Ellie, she confirms the town truly is sealed off with no way out. Arriving outside a warehouse, it turns out Mark has visited here often to practice his graffiti, but never noticed the shady Sebek activity. Before they enter, Yase swings by to report the school is not only not safe anymore, but it's vanished entirely. Staying calm, Nanjo thinks it's the effects of the Deva system, and they must get Kandori to reverse it. The group moves ahead through the abandoned factory, finding it contains a secret underground passage that leads directly to the Sebek building. Finding Kandori's office, they hear another man named Takeda reporting that Maki's mother got away from them, but then Kandori telling them they need to stay focused on the Deva system. Barging in, the group confronts Kandori and his right-hand man Takeda, as he remarks this is not the first juvenile he's dealt with today. Nanjo speaks up, calling him out and wondering if the company president knows of his scheming. Takeda moves to take them all out, but Nanjo moves faster, targeting Kandori but finding his persona has no effect on him. Rather, Kandori is surprised to see the group has the power too, revealing he has his own powerful persona before getting away. The group defeats Takeda and his persona, and begins chasing Kandori, finding a hidden door that leads to a secret underground lab. They overhear him talking to a Dr. Nikolai, who is against further refining the Deva system despite creating it. Nikolai comments how Kandori didn't have to send a student earlier into a dimensional rift, but Kandori isn't going to let ethics get in the way of this project. The group challenges him, but he doesn't consider them worth his time, moving ahead with the doctor inside the Deva system itself. Maki mentions she recognizes Kandori in this machine somehow, but they are interrupted as they hear a scared Kandori shouting inside that he's disappearing. Dr. Nikolai chooses to make the corrupt Kandori pay, even if he goes down with him, but something goes wrong as though Kandori starts to disappear, he suddenly begins rematerializing and realizing someone's intervention. Dr. Nikolai is dismayed to see his plan foiled as a little girl in black now appears, saying she won't allow Kandori to die. Reality now shifts as Kandori gets away and the group is transported to their school, but seemingly six months ago before certain renovations occurred. They suddenly hear another classmate thought missing, Yosuke, is injured, and looking into it, they see it is indeed him. He's relieved to see them, and explains that two months ago, he and his girlfriend Shisato wandered into this world. Nanjo then wonders if this is not the past, but rather a parallel world, and Yosuke says it's mostly the same as their old world, but some locations are drastically different, like the hospital is now a castle. He then brings up the Maki they have with them is actually this dimension's Maki, and Maki confirms this, as she wasn't sure at first of crossing worlds since it happened while she was taking a nap. Mark is now concerned for their original Maki when they suddenly feel a rumble and hear the girl in black say she's removed all the exits to the school and trapped them. Moving to protect the students from demons, they see the recent transfer student, the physically strong but standoffish Reiji, already doing the same, able to hold his own thanks to his own persona, the mythic Irish king, Brace. Nanjo suspects he was the student Kandori sent away with the Deva system before they were also caught, and questions why Reiji is also after Kandori. Reiji is reluctant to share, saying only that after drifting through the void Kandori sent him to, a small child in white appeared before him and he found himself here. Mark invites him to join them in taking down Kandori, hoping that will be the way back home, and he agrees, joining the group. As the group continues securing the school, they run into the little girl in black again, defeating her monster and relieving the school of demons. Yosuke comes out to thank them and wants to introduce them to the person who helped him and believed his story about crossing dimensions. He introduces them to the Satomu of this world, who not only believes them too, but also lets them know of a strange black door that appeared recently. He mentions him helping them was also ordained by a man named Philemon he met, and Maki thanks to visit Elias Shrine and see him. Their friendly guide indeed greets them there, telling them all that this is the mirror world where Kandori's ambitions lie. He adds that in pursuing Kandori, they will also learn the truth of this world and how to return home. Kandori's base is on the east side of town where he searches for something, and should he obtain it, it will spell doom for both worlds. 
After defeating a strong enemy guarding the subway tunnels, the little girl in black now appears to taunt them again, this time calling herself Aki. Moving along, they hear of someone called the Harem Queen, and seeing her palace, note that her paintings are the same as their missing classmate and Maki's best friend, Chisato. Investigating this, they find a warped version of Chisato is the Harem Queen, who was gifted a mirror from Aki which granted all of her wishes, guided by her jealousy of Maki. She uses the mirror to send them away, but when they return, they notice her face gets blotchier the more she indulges in its power. Furious, she turns their friends to stone and attacks Naoya and Maki at full power. Though she loses to the duo, Maki still thinks of when they were friends and wants to help her alongside their other classmates. Yosuke comes in and agrees, stating proudly that he still loves Chisato even with her marred face, and between the love and friendship, the black mirror shatters, lifting the curse on Chisato and her friends. She directs them to the castle Aki mentioned for a lead to Kandori, and following it, they learn they need a key to enter the castle, and that specific key is in the Lost Forest where the police station used to be. Venturing within, they find a gingerbread house and are surprised to find the little girl in white again, whom Maki recognizes as Mai. She insists Aki is the bad version of her that came out when Kandori approached her in her loneliness. Nanjo notices the compact mirror she has, and Mai claims it grants her wishes and created this entire town. Unfortunately, Aki took half of it, so she cannot use it to send them home or deal with Kandori. Naoya talks to Mai and persuades her to loan them her half for now, but when they return, Nanjo waits until after they use it and it disappears to point out that retreating and bringing the missing half of the locket is likely exactly what Kandori wanted. However, since they still needed it to enter, knowing that would not have changed their options. Fighting their way to the throne room, Reiji calls out the smug Kandori by his full name, as Kandori reveals he is Reiji's stepbrother, and Reiji was a bastard child of their family. Reiji refuses his family name and takes up his mother's name, here to settle things for how their father used and abused her. Kandori says that has nothing to do with him, and he should take up his vendetta with their father's grave. He now thanks the group for obtaining both halves of the compacts for him, as he has Aki claim both and use it to summon a large black mirror. Within, he shows them their original world, as the center of their town is demolished and replaced with his new castle, Deva Yuga. The compact was no ordinary compact, but instead the Mirror of Chaos, as he now claims a new power over dimensions without need of the Deva system, naming himself a god and promptly leaving. They help up Reiji, who starts to open up more to the group and is more committed now to stopping whatever Kandori is planning, but they wonder how to return to their world to even pursue him. Maki remembers there is a haunted mansion rumored to spirit people away and wonders if it isn't moving them across dimensions instead, and so they investigate. Within, they encounter a demon who Mark recognizes the voice of as Maki's mother. Choosing not to fight her, the illusion breaks and she reverts to her true form, as Mark deduced it had to have been Maki's mother from their original world since the Maki in this world does not have a mother. Though she wonders why she doesn't exist in this world, Maki's mother is before a dimensional gateway and stays behind to stabilize it so the students can continue chasing Kandori. Finally returning to their original world, they all find themselves in the Davis system chamber. They are surprised to find Dr. Nikolai had survived after all, but now strangely talking like he's possessed. Kandori now appears himself, explaining he has brainwashed all surviving humans into sharing his desire for annihilation, and mentions with a word he could order everyone to kill each other. Maki questions why he's doing all this, and Kandori coyly replies that it's unlike her to wonder that, challenging them to do anything about it. Storming Deva Yuga, they confront Kandori once more, who is confident in his supreme power. He tells Aki to step aside, and talking to the group, he tells them he won't do anything further, confusing them. Rather, he asks them all what they are living for, as all people need a goal in order to give them the strength to carry on. He tells them that once every desire has been fulfilled, all that is left is empty solitude, and wonders if it was better not to have tried to attain all desires at all. With no dream left because of all of his power, his original goal of ending humanity doesn't give him any satisfaction anymore. He allowed the group to come this far just to ask them one question about what drove them to fight for their lives in the first place. They reply individually, including that while they may never understand the reason for life, they don't need one in order to believe in themselves and live life without regrets. Nanjo then observes the real reason behind Kandori's sulking is actually because he knows obtaining this power was not his own doing, but he's so pathetic he doesn't know how else to live once he got his goal. He then suspects Aki's dream of destroying humanity likely comes from her uncertainty of the future, and he's just doing everything he can to run away from his fears, and Nanjo's words hit their mark. Maddened, Kandori stands up to destroy the group himself, dueling them with his own persona, the Lovecraftian outer god near Lodotep. Edging out a win, his persona speaks for itself now, taking control over Kandori and mutating his body into an even more powerful one against his will. As the willful students of St. Hermelin High School defeat the foolish ambition of a man who did not know what to do with the throne of a god, Kandori admits to Nanjo that his estimations were correct and feels an odd satisfaction at being beaten. 
Nanjo then demands to know where the real Maki is, and Kandori reveals the mirror world was actually just a figment of imagination of the real Maki, as the Maki with them is just her idealized version, and that mirror town was just a version from inside her heart. Similarly, Mai and Aki are just opposite shadows of Maki's heart, and the Maki with them is just another aspect in between. Maki dreamed up her ideal version of her town, and trapped her crush Yosuke and her best friend Shisato within it. It all started a month ago with a test run of the Deva system, as Maki was actually linked and synchronized to the system since even before then, able to create this dream reality. Maki is in denial of all this, and Kandori invites her to confront the truth herself, as the real Maki is indeed inside this castle, and warns them not to run from the truth and end up like him. Following her, the group finds a room with the bedridden Maki they know alongside her creations, hooked up to a machine. The Maki in Grey they traveled with begins to break down and lash out, saying she was always jealous of the normal life everyone else got to live, and secretly hated them all for it. Since she couldn't do anything about it, they made up her own imaginary world, but now realizes she doesn't belong in this world in the first place, moving to the Mirror of Chaos nearby and entering to return to the other world. Mark wants to enter the world inside Maki's heart to help her still, but Nanjo insists they should destroy the Deva system and save the entire town, even though the real Maki is hooked up to it as a lifeline and will likely die. Mark punches him down, telling him Maki also tried to save them, and so they need to believe in her and help her break free of the system with her own strength. To which Nanjo smirks, revealing he said that to test the group's resolve. United, they prepare to enter her heart, but from the other side, Maki shatters the gateway device and mirror, preventing them from following her. Mark notices her broken compact fall out, and they now see the real Maki has a similar compact too. Finding a shard of the Chaos Mirror, they affix it to the broken compact and find they can use it to travel to the Mirror Town now. They arrive next to Maki's mother, catching her up to the situation and allowing her to accompany them. Hearing crying, they find Mai, the Maki in white, and comfort her, and she reveals Aki went to Pandora, a very bad version of Maki, and undid her seal, still intent on ending the town. She then tells them the Maki in grey is lost in the woods, and finding her, they are surprised to find her lying down in a bed, turning to reveal she no longer has a face. Nanjo then speaks to her, choosing not to pity her, but instead remind her to stop moping and realizing she has friends that care for her, with or without her. Reflecting on this, the Maki in Grey returns and not only forgives herself but her mother too, as she is ready to help save the real Maki. Returning to the Maki in white, they reconcile as Mai tells them they need one last compact from Maki's consciousness elsewhere in order to approach Pandora. Returning to Elia's shrine, Philemon is there too, saying the Elia cavern behind him leads to the Sea of All Mankind's Souls, where all souls originate and return to. The true Maki's soul is about to return and now calls for Nalia and Maki and Grey to help her, and only those called may enter. Within, the duo was surprised to find another version of Nalia here, playing a video game, who recounts every choice Nalia has made along his journey, and after passing judgement, rewards Nalia's strength of will with the keys to unlock their ultimate personas. Pushing forward past the Sea of Souls, they finally find Maki's consciousness, who still wishes she was never born. Both Makis speak with each other and try to reach an understanding, resulting in Maki's consciousness giving them the final key they need to reach Pandora. Returning back to the group, they head back to the school where it all began to see about Pandora. When they come back, they see no one else in the school except for Yosuke and Chisato, and Yosuke mentions the eastern side of town has vanished too. Three mirrors in hand, Maki opens a way forward, where the group fights the depths of Maki's heart to enter the nest of Pandora. Besides seeing a nightmarish form of Maki, they also spot the core of the Deva system behind it. Speaking it refuses to give up the device, calling it a gateway to paradise and intending to make its own nihilistic world. Clashing against the darkness in Maki's heart, Nalia fights against the rising form of Pandora as it sheds its shell into a reality-altering butterfly. Pandora is overwhelmed by their unbreakable will, as the motley mix of classmates believe not only in themselves, but each other. Maki then approaches Pandora, reminding her they are both necessary parts of the real Maki, and accepting each other, the literal and internal battle is finally over. With this, the Maki in Grey turns to bid farewell to the group, thanking them for the fun and support she needed. She sends them all back to their world, leaving Naoya for last, to whom she hopes will still think of her after this, giving him a kiss and confessing her love for him. As the game ends, Philemon congratulates them on their feet and for discovering their true selves along the way, no longer wearing false smiles as masks and bearing strong hearts that can weather anything going forward. Wishing them well, he removes his own mask and rises up, dissipating into butterflies of light. The world would soon return to normal, and the identities of the students involved in the incidents would remain hidden. Time would pass for the nine students as they would all graduate together, and celebrating afterwards, each student would look forward to a future of their own making. Maki would no longer be ill, continuing her artistic passion, repair her relationship with her mother, and continue dating Naoya. Ayase would get a job as a secretary and marry a co-worker, living life as a carefree housewife. 
Ellie would pursue a career in modeling, Yukino would pursue photography, and Mark would gain some notoriety as a street artist in New York himself. Nanjo would temper his attitude with humility and lead a successful executive career. Brown would find fame and fortune on TV, though would still keep tabs on Mark. Finally, Reiji would calm down, settle down with a kind woman, and raise a child of his own. As for Naoya, he would continue to live his own life, and like Maki, discover his own reason for living. Shin Megami Tensei Persona has enjoyed the success of selling over 600,000 copies worldwide. <laughs>